Bibles, and I uh, will read the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled round your waist, with the best spirit of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. That's the word of the Lord. Welcome, Reverend. Good afternoon. Uh, we thank God for bringing us to his house. And I'm especially happy because I came with my wife. <laughs> I've come many Sundays without her. And she arrived last night, and then this morning she told me, jet lag or no jet lag, I'm not going to miss church. <laughs> that was good. She's here. Uh, we thank God for the worship team and the choir. They, they are coming up very well. And we also would like to thank Marion for leading us this morning. And we welcome all those who are visiting with us today in a special way, feel in God's presence. And we pray that you connect with God throughout this service. As you know, our theme this year is Farm in the Faith, based on 1 Corinthians 16:13 which says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. And following this theme, we have had expository preaching on the book of Hebrews and Galatians. And the preaching series this month is on hidden lies. And we have covered prosperity, gospel, cults, and today we look at the occult. Uh, one of the things that I would like to, to say is that um, when we are talking about this, sometimes you feel as if you are emphasizing more on the fake currency rather than the real currency. Let's still remember what we need to know more than anything else is the word of God and our position in Christ. And so even as we go through this, let it be that we are learning so that we can stand firm in the faith. Oh, now, what is, okay, what is there and what is here is different, so I hope, I hope this is okay. Um, look at what is happening at the, at the back so that I can be knowing whether I have the right slide or so. <laughs> but I want to start by giving a very brief definition the word occult comes from a Latin word for hidden. And the word occult is generally associated with secret knowledge and practices dealing with the supernatural or psychic phenomena, often for the purpose of obtaining personal power. So when you listen to all this, uh, that's, that's a brief definition of what it is. And now I can't, can, can we do something about that one so that I may know whether I'm on the right slide? Uh, 
still showing the Ephesians passage. Huh? I, I can, but I want to see whether we are together. Is there any difficult? Just one minute. That's what they are showing me. One minute. So we give them one minute. Okay. Um, I hope that uh, it, will, it will be the same. Um, when, we, when we talk of, eh? you're still asking for one minute. Oh, oh okay. Oh, uh, yeah, that is good. Now it's good. So, but we'll, go, we'll continue. Uh, when, when we talk of awkward, it's, you cannot pinpoint at one particular thing. It's a collection of beliefs and practices founded on the premise that human beings can tap into a supernatural world. That's, that's what we need to remember. And once connected to this other realm, various rituals and special knowledge are used by those involved in the occult to allow a person to gain abilities and power they would otherwise not possess. And these powers include controlling the natural world or other people. That's the main thing. Now, when we think, <laughs> what is the Okay. When we think of this biblically, the Bible, tell, uh, when you go through the Bible and you think of occult, the occult is any practice that tries to do three things. One is to gain supernatural power, abilities, or knowledge apart from the creator God. So if you find anything that is seeking or trying to gain supernatural powers, abilities, or knowledge apart from the creator God, in the Bible, we would call it all court. There are many uh, avenues through which this is propagated. We have many publishers of occultic books and magazines, and there are many occultic websites as well. Now, I'm saying this so that we may all know that it is common knowledge. It is in the public domain. It's not something which is hidden. An interest in the occult has been promoted by, among others, the New Age movement, the rise of neo paganism, including a call to detestable traditional practices, movies, this is films, some video games, including games for children, cartoons, some cartoons, and even some heavy metal rock bands they have been promoting it. Music is never neutral. Music is either to praise God or to praise man and Satan. It is never neutral. It has a source and it has a purpose. Some with coded messages. And there, there, there are many examples uh, that we could go to uh, I think some of you might have seen a clip that was just going round, uh, talking of one of them being a message that is just dog sinatas. And what it was was that it is reading from behind that Satan is, do is God. There are others that might sound harmless, but when you go deeper, you find that um, they are actually not worshiping God but worshiping Satan or elevating man. Some of the examples of occultic practices include fortune telling and divination, 
And in Acts chapter 16, verse 16 following, uh, we, we read of a story of a slave girl that was following Paul and Silas. And she kept on saying, these are servants of God. But she was a fortune teller. And there was a spirit in her that was showing her things. And her bosses were making money out of that fortune telling. And Peter and John, uh, Peter and um, Paul and Silas cast out uh, the spirit out of the girl and there was chaos for them because now these people were not going to get money in the fortune telling. There are also other practices including horoscopes. There are many people who would not go out without looking at their stars and it becomes something that enslaves them. Uh, there is witchcraft. You might have heard of Illuminati, magic, secret societies. Some of them say that they are not secret societies. They are societies with secret. I, I don't know the difference. But they are secret societies. Voodoo and any other practice which is known as devil worship. Uh, this morning I'm not here, or this afternoon, I'm not here to promote and expound on the occultic practices, but to warn you as a believer to beware and to run away from anything that does not glorify God. If it is glorifying anything else other than God, beware of it. Our purpose is not to satisfy our curiosity about occultic practices, but to warn us of the hostility of the powers of darkness and to learn on how to overcome them. That is our purpose. Uh, we, we, we are not here to, to expound on that. The occultic practices are against what God in Christ Jesus has planned for us as believers. You find that across the board, that they will be opposed to whatever God has planned for us through Jesus Christ as believers. So run away from any practice that tries to gain supernatural power, abilities, or knowledge apart from the creator God as I have mentioned there before. We, we might think of ourselves uh, and think of the, the late 90s and, and early, uh, late ni ni 80s and early 90s. There was a lot of preaching and teaching about the powers of darkness. And there are some, some of you who might remember that uh, tapes and books on this front were very popular. They were selling. Some of you might recall a small booklet called uh, Delivered from the Powers of Darkness by Emmanuel Eni. Uh, I think some of you who are old enough. Uh, there were many books by Rebecca Brown. He came to set the captives free, prepare for war, and broken curses, among others. And people learned a lot uh, to do with uh, the, the powers of darkness. Some of them might have gone into unnecessary graphics of the occult, which might not be useful because of uh, uh, not, not, not elevating the other side, you know, the word of God. As I said, sometimes if we, we are seen to be elevating too much uh, the fake, we might miss the real thing. But it's also good for us to read and to be aware of these things. So if you come across such books, read, but read with caution. Because as we, as we stand here, I want to say that we are fighting from a position of victory in Jesus Christ. Whatever we say, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And the powers of darkness can never defeat 
the kingdom of God. Never. But we need to be in the picture so that we know what we are, we are in, uh, what we are fighting. And so let's not live in bondage or fear. When we hear that there are these powers, let's not live under fear. Some of you might recall uh, that there was a commission here in Kenya. If we come uh, right to our grounds, on 20th October 1994, President Daniel Arap Moy established what was known as the Devil Worship Commission. Uh, some of you are old enough, 1994, and the commission was tasked to look into the matter of devil worship in Kenya. On it were church leaders from mostly mainland churches and also well-known lawyers in this city. And the commission presented the report, its report to the president towards the end of 1995. But that report was not released. He said he was not going to release it because it, was, uh, it contained very sensitive information. I, you commission an inquiry, and then you don't want to disclose. But in 1999, the then Minister for Internal Security, Julius Sunkuli, presented the, the report to Parliament. And so we know what uh, their conclusion was. The report concluded that devil worship was commonplace in Kenya and recommended establishing, listen to this, a special police force to investigate crimes of the all court. <laughs> that was a recommendation that was done by, by this group, that we need a special police force to investigate crimes of the all court. The commission's report also included numerous reports of ritual murder here in Kenya, human sacrifice here in Kenya. Sometimes we, we hear some of these things and we feel as if they are far-fetched, as if they are not in our country. Human sacrifice in Kenya, cannibalism, and feats of magic alleged Done, allegedly done by, uh, by using powers acquired through such acts. It also reported that Satanists had infiltrated non-indigenous religion, religious groups, and other organizations, making them doorways to Satanism. The commission is no longer functioning, and the government took no action to follow up on the report. So no special police force was established, but Jesus had done it on Calvary. He called you and I to be soldiers of the cross and to stand firm in the faith established through the shedding of his blood. And so although the Kenya government was shy of doing it, we are not shy to be called soldiers of the cross. Amen? And that's why we are talking about this, so that we may know what war we are waging against the powers of darkness. But as I have said, it's, the main thing is not to expound on occultic practices or to promote them, but to warn you as a believer to be wary and to run away from anything which is not godly to run away from any practice that tries to gain, uh, I say three things. One is supernatural power, abilities, or knowledge apart from the creator God. If you remove God from the equation, uh, then uh, run away from that. And I want to take you to Deuteronomy chapter 8 because there is a passage that I would like us to think of in addition to the Ephesian passage. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, the people of Israel were warned against occultic practices. And that is what we are warning us uh, as believers today. So let's read this passage. It says from verse 9, we are reading Deuteronomy 8, 9 to 13. When you enter the land, 
up to 18, 13 to 8, 9 to Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 13. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, and gauges in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of, this, because of this, these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. That warning still stands. It was to the children of Israel of old. But now it is to the new Israel, the believers, you and I. And as I have said before, we must run from such practices. These practices that do not glorify God. And in Ephesians chapter 6, the, verse, uh, the, the, the passage that was read to us, occultic practices are called devil's schemes. And they are in conflict with the will of God. And I would like to us to read this passage again from Ephesians. Uh, if you could put it in the big, big numbers. It says, Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can... Take your stand against the devil's schemes. And verse 12, in particular, please note, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and, again, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. You are being told how to stand firm. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Amen? Some of these passages are so explicit and they speak volume to us. Um, I'd like to go back um, to... This passage is describing what is known as spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. It's a, it's a wide subject. We might not be able to cover it here. But as believers, we are at war. And our war is not with human beings, but with cosmic intelligences. Our enemies are not human, but demonic. These forces are powerful, wicked, and cunning. And you need to remember that. There are times when we speak of uh, God's power, we say Jesus' power, superpower. Satan power, powerless power. Uh, he has power. And it was given to him. 
You know, it starts right from the beginning. God created everything, including Satan himself, and he rebelled. Lucifer rebelled. And he was thrown from heaven together with a third of the angels. That third of angels are the ones which are called demons. And they are the ones who do the bidding of Satan himself. And so when yeah, something happens and you say that it is Satan, it might not be Satan himself because Satan is not everywhere, but his foot soldiers, demons, because he is not like God, he is not everywhere, but he has foot soldiers, he has demons that come to molest you, come to uh, put you in trouble for one reason or the other, because they are destructive. And this passage is describing the warfare that we go through. As believers, we are at war, and our, our war is not with human beings. It's cosmic, cosmic intelligences. It's with demonic uh, powers. These forces, I have, I have said, you remember, they are powerful, they are wicked, and cunning. Those three things uh, are are common across the demonic world. They have their powers, but their power is limited. It's not the power that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we read in Romans and say, what shall separate us from the love of God? We denounce any other power or any other situation that could separate us from the, uh, from the love of God. Not because we are capable, but because of who is in us. That's why we keep on saying, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are not talking of ourselves being greater than Satan. No, we are not. We are not saying that we are powerful than Satan. No, we are not. But God, in Jesus Christ, has given us a position that makes us greater than he that is in the world. Amen? And so we don't need to fear whatever they do but they are cunning. Power itself is neutral, we know that. It can be well used or misused. Our spiritual enemies use the powers, their powers destructively rather than constructively for evil and not for good. And so they, they have power, but their power is misused. It's used for destruction, not for good. And that's why we need to beware of them. In other words, there are two kingdoms. There are two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Sometimes we, 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 we talk about this and we know at the back of our minds, but then we forget that these two kingdoms are not coexisting peacefully. There's war. There's something that is going on between the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of dark darkness has its king called Satan. And, the, and he wants to be in charge of the universe. That's what he wants. However, there is no question that the kingdom of God and his king, Jesus Christ, are firmly in charge. The, this world, whatever we are, it's God who is in charge. It's not Satan. Jesus' eternal victory is already assured. But God has allowed us to choose in our individual lives who will be in charge. That's a choice. You can allow the evil one to take, care, uh, to take over control of your life. Or you can surrender yourself totally to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this... The war that we are calling spiritual warfare is an angelic conflict. The archangel Michael and the holy angels who remained in heaven are fighting Satan and the angels who rebelled with him. And this is described in the book of Revelation chapter 12 from verse 7 to 12. And this is what it says. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 12. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. 
but he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. That is giving the genesis of uh, the fall of the evil one. The great dragon was howled down. That ancient serpent, serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's possible for you to project the, the one which, which I was talking about. Not, not efficient, but revelation so that people can see these words. It's always good. But if you have your Bible, please open. It is Revelation 7, uh, 12, 7 to 12. And it's always good to have your Bible so that you can follow it. Even when it is not projected, you can follow in your Bible. Let me read it again. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was howled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was howled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accused them before our God day and night has been howled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from, de from death. Therefore, rejoice you heaven and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. Be filled with fury because he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. This war that we are talking about uh, as the war in the heavenly places affects what is happening on earth. We are in the midst of an angelic conflict, a satanic rebellion in which Satan is seeking to bring this whole world under his dominion. That's his purpose, to bring this whole world under his dominion. That means that when you are born in the kingdom of God, you are born into war. You are enlisted. And we are surrounded by our spiritual enemy. But the battle that we are fighting is not for land or anything physical. This battle is for glory. The issue is who is to get the glory in the universe? Who is going to be worshipped? That is the issue. It's nothing to do with the land. It has nothing to do with anything physical. It is to do with the universe. Who is to get the glory in the universe? Who is going to be worshipped? Is it God? Is it Satan? And that war continues. Satan wants the glory for himself. But in Isaiah 48 verse 11, God says that he will not yield his glory to another. That's what he says. The battle is for the throne of creation. Praise God, the outcome has, has never been in doubt. But the battle goes on every day in our lives as to who will get the glory by what we do. That is why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Because you are in war, you need to know which side you are on. And the same is repeated in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Do it to the glory of God as a believer. 
And so this is the fundamental nature of the battle. Who is going to be worshipped? It's nothing else but the glory who is going to be worshipped. There, there is what has come to be known as the seven mountains. Since 1972, uh, this concept of seven mountains of societal influence. And this refers to what we would also call as seven pillars of culture or spheres of society. This include religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. There are spiritual battles over who is going to have the power to influence the culture. And you find that there is infiltration of cults into all this. When I talk of religion, I'm not talking of Christianity only. I'm talking of religions, and there are many. And that can be one of the areas through which it is fought. If you look at it, you see that it is where people are. That's where the fight is, where society is, the culture of the society. If you are able to turn the culture of society from worshiping God to worshiping something else, you have turned them from God. And that is the essence of what the, the occultic world is trying to do, to take us away from God. The spiritual battle over these mountains is going on and on all the time. And so there are issues to do with our families. Even this LGBT is part of that. When you think of education, there are issues that we are struggling with right now and we know that they are not godly. I have mentioned here even the age of consent that we are trying to bring to 16. We are promoting immorality and we are trying to say it is good. There are even texts that have been uh, uh, produced so as to teach sex education to children in primary school uh, in a very explicit manner, a manner in which they will almost go to practice. It's part of the sphere. When we think of the government, and we think of some of the things that are being propagated from what we call the world order. They are against the will of God. Uh, they are against what we would stand for as believers. And so the battle is in these spheres, and you need to be alert. And where you have uh, a say, speak out, and speak out uh, loudly for the Lord. We need to know the schemes that the devil has in place to influence these spheres of societal influence and combat them. But remember that this is a spiritual battle. It's not something that you're going to uh, re, uh, decide at Harambe House, Jogo House, or even Treasury. It is a spiritual battle. It's going to be won spiritually. And Satan is not afraid of you and I. He's not even afraid of commissions being gathered here and there. But he cannot stand up against God at all. This is why Paul is telling us in Ephesians, the passage that we read, 6, verse 10 and 11. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Sometimes we hear this. Uh, we used to say that there are things that get into one ear and get out through the other. I pray that it will not do that this morning. Paul is telling us to put on the full armor of God, and it was tabulated for us later on. We might not have time to go into the details but the reason as to why he has done that is so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It is when God fights that battle for you that you win, not when you fight the battle for yourself. You can never win against the devil if 
You know, he is cunning. Very cunning. I said powerful, wicked, cunning. Very cunning. There is an example that I saw in one of the books that I was reading. Uh, that there was a farmer who was having watermelon and it was doing very well. But then all of a sudden there were thieves, people stealing. And so he devised uh, a, a method to combat that. And he poisoned one of the watermelons and put a signboard. One of these melons is poisoned. And so that night, there was no stealing of the watermelons because people did not know which one was poisoned. But the following day, somebody else came and wrote, two of these melons are poisoned. Now even the farmer himself could not <laughs> eat any of it. And so he had to destroy everything. And the devil is equally cunning because his work is destruction. That farmer was destroyed. He thought that he had a scheme which he could use, but finally it could not work. And I want to say that when we are being told to be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, we are being told that you not win by your own tactics, but the tactic that the Lord will give you. Victory is found in depending on God, and so Satan's plan is to detach us from dependence on God. Anything that detaches you from God and you want now to have your own uh, right and you can stand on your own, you don't need God. And that is what sometimes we are doing. We are telling God to get out of our businesses. We are telling God that we don't need you in this system or the other. It's as if you are saying we can do it on our own, but we cannot. We need God. And victory is found on God. And so Satan's plan is to remove us from that dependence on God. Satan has a definite strategy. He has a, 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 a strategy. And his strategy can be understood in one word, deception. Lies. Satan's strategy for your life and mine is to deceive us. He is the master deceiver. And this ha has been going on since our first parents, Adam and Eve. You remember they were deceived? And he came and told them, did God really say this? And he also wants to be, to camouflage like the good guy. Actually, if you eat this, you'll be no more knowledgeable. <laughs> you know the, the right and the wrong. And did he say that you'll die? How can you die? Deception. We know that death came through Adam. But as death came through Adam, life came through Jesus Christ. So the, 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 the end product is already known. Satan is defeated. There is historical defeat on the cross. And there is eternal defeat as we see it in Revelation chapter 12. And so this is what Satan is always doing. The, the tactic, the, the strategy that he has is deception. The reason why Satan has turned to deception is because he can never be as powerful as God is. Satan tried to overcome God in heaven. He failed. We know it. He failed. Satan's power will never match God's power. It can never. And since he cannot match God's power, he tries to maximize what he has. And deception is his strong avenue. So he will camouflage, he will try to make things look good. He has turned deception into art. And this will go into all these spheres that I have mentioned. There will be deception. And we start uh, talking to ourselves in a manner that we are likely to even fight. There are societies that have come up specifically to deceive us on certain fronts. And we need to, to know that they are there. So certain organization is heavily disguised. And that's why it is in, in secret most of the time. But 
the end product that they want to serve to us is a product that they want to show is a good one that you cannot do without this if you want to enjoy life, if you want to live uh, better, then you better follow this. I remember there's a time uh, I even received uh, a letter. I don't know how people got my, it's the time when there wasn't even email. But I got a letter through the mail in the office telling me that I could go to a certain place to get a ring to protect me and to give me power. And I know there are so many people who are going to get rings which have got powers. And they are putting them on their fingers. We might not tell. I, I have a finger, a, a, a ring given by Miriam here. This, this has only power to love her, <laughs> not to do anything else. But it is deception because you become captive. May the Lord help us to come out of it. Anything that is trying to bring power, supernatural and uh, power, and it is not from God, let's resist it. Because finally, it is going to be destructive. He, uh, his work is to destroy. It's not to build. He doesn't. And sometimes you might think that he's a friend. There's a, there, there's a, a song that we used uh, a long time ago that uh, you think that Satan is your friend. But the end of it will be very bad. Some of you might know that song. Uh, that you are hiding, you think that Satan is a friend, but a time is coming and you know who he is. May the Lord help us to know that Satan comes to destroy, not to build. And so some people have been put under bondage and they have been led to do things that they would otherwise not have done because of that bondage. So whatever labor you give to Satan's deception, the basis is the same. Satan hates truth. And he will try to lead people astray from all, uh, from all that truth, all the truth, all the time. And so the strategy that he is using is basically twofold. One, for believers, one of certain purposes is to interrupt the process by which God gets glory through our lives. So if you see anything interrupting the process by which God is given glory in your life, watch out. He wants to lend, render us ineffective in terms of any real impact for Christ. So we could be calling ourselves Christians and we could be moving about doing things that we, we think that, that are Christian, uh, you know, things. But if the process by which God is glorified is interrupted, we become ineffective and there is no real impact. And secondly, the second strategy that the devil is using is he wants to deflect you or and me, divert you from doing the will of God by frustrating God's will for our lives. And you can see all this, why he is removing us from God, from dependence on God, is because he knows he cannot win as long God is on our side. And that's why Paul said, if God be on our side, who can be against us? It was a big statement that he was making here. And he looked at different situations and issues that we could say that this can remove me from the love of God. But he said, in all creation, in all spheres of life, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. But you can remove yourself because the, you have a choice. If you don't surrender to the Lord Jesus and surrender totally, you find yourself defeated and doing things that are things that make you into a slave. But Satan is a defeated foe. Amen? Amen? He was defeated by our Lord Jesus Christ at the cross, and he would be defeated in the end, as we see in Revelation. We call it historical defeat and, we, and eternal defeat. And that defeat is total. Historical defeat was on the, on, on the cross. When he defeated 
what the plan that the evil one had. He, uh, the eternal defeat is well choreographed in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12, which I was reading earlier on. And so we need to, to know the, ta the, the strategies that the evil one is using and come out of it. And we need to know that the Lord is victorious. Amen? What are we to do? Because that's, that's the way I want to leave you. There are a few things, and these are all based from the word of God. It's not my opinion. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Sometimes this, the word of God cannot be more explicit. I cannot say it better in my own words. It's just telling us, set your hearts on things above. It's telling us, set your minds on things above. So it is your heart and your mind. And you remember in Ephesians chapter 6 and 7, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication, let all your needs be known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? This is the same thing that Colossians is telling us. Paul is telling us in Colossians that we set our minds there. Then we shall be free. Then we come to James. And James chapter 4 is a chapter that I would like you to constantly go to. But in verse 7a, it says, submit yourselves then to God. If we have said that apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from God, we will not win the battle. Then James is telling us, submit yourselves then to God. And then in part B of that, James 7b says, resist the devil. And what will happen? He will flee from you. Sometimes we don't resist him. We seem to welcome him. Because it looks as if it's something which is harmless and something that looks good. So the music that he plays to us might sound the, the beats that we want. And the, the, the places he, he wants us to visit are the in things. It's the place where you will feel that you belong to a, a world which is progressive. Because sometimes they use words that will contrast what we do. So we are taught to be conservative. But if you want to be progressive, move this direction. And all the time there is that odd camouflage that comes as if these are the better people. These are the better guys. This is the better position. The word of God is telling us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And James 4, 8, the very first part of it that says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Amen. Uh, may the Lord give you understanding in all these things. Some of these things we have expounded. And in conclusion, I want to say this. The Bible tells us to stand firm. That means to hold the ground. Jesus has already won for us. Uh, we, are, we are not talking of you trying to or create a world. Our job is to hold the ground Jesus has won, not to fight to win. We are fighting from a position of victory, not for victory. And there's a difference between the two. Fighting from a position of victory, not for victory. What am I saying? We are saying that it has already been done. It's already done. And even when we are fighting, we know that it is already done. I was telling the 9 o'clock service that some, I like watching football at times, not all the time. And sometimes my team, if I'm watching live, could be going through a very difficult moment. And I'm not sure how it will end. And so I'm sitting at the edge of my seat. I'm trying to encourage myself, all is going to be well. 
And so until the final whistle, I do not know what is happening. But sometimes I watch, I hear uh, that the, the game was, was over last night. I was, maybe I was sleeping and I want to watch. But I am told your team won. So I know whatever happens, even when I see as if my team is losing, I know finally we, we are the ones who are going to win. And so I sit and enjoy the game, isn't it? Now that is what the word of God is telling us. It is telling us stand firm in the faith because the victory has already been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. He won on the cross and eternally the word of God which cannot lie is telling us he is a defeated foe. Amen? And so whatever happens, do not live under fear but stand firm in the faith. And we are saying run away from any practice that tries to gain supernatural power, abilities, or knowledge apart from the creator God. Those are schemes of the evil one to deceive you into worshiping him, worshiping the evil one. We are to worship God and him alone. And so stand firm in the faith. Amen. Amen. I pray that the Lord will give you understanding that you take time to examine yourself Know whether there are areas where you have been deceived, where there are areas that you have gone into without knowing that you are going into the enemy's territory. The word of God tells us to repent. If we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May the Lord give us that ability to know what is going on. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we do want to thank you that the victory is ours through Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for what you did on Calvary. And we want to pray, O oh God, that even as we go through this world and we have all these wars, all these conflicts, all the troubles that we might go because of your name, that we know that you have won the battle. And so we go out as victorious, but also aware of the powers of darkness, the wickedness, and the cunning uh, elements that they carry. So help us, O oh God. And now, Father, I pray that no one will go out of this place with fear, but they will go with courage, knowing that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I pray that each one of us will desire to stand firm in the faith, come what may. And Father, I pray that you may bless your people as they go home. Bless them in their homes. Bless them in their businesses throughout this week. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.